if you think about New York's population, which is about six, 7% of the nation's population, the New York program has recovered about 10 or 11% of what the IRS whistleblower program recovers. Corporate fraud works best in the shadows, behind corporate walls. How does the government bring these wrongdoers to justice? Whistleblowers. These are the stories of those who risk their careers to shine a light on allegations of fraud. Today on Fraud in America. We're going to try something a little different this time. We are starting to recognize some of the trends in the fraud fighting world. This episode is going to look at some of the states that are leading the charge in fighting tax fraud. During this time of economic uncertainty, a lot of the states and the federal government are experiencing large tax gaps. Some states are doing something about it. New York, in particular, is leading the charge by putting in place a false claims act that encourages whistleblowers to step forward to go after massive tax fraud schemes. To help us understand what happened in New York, we have the founding bureau chief of the New York Attorney General's Taxpayer Protection Bureau, Mr. Randy Fox. Randy is now a partner in the New York office of the law firm Kirby McInerney, where he represents whistleblowers in state and federal false claims act cases and before the IRS, SEC, and CFTC whistleblower offices. He recently had a $105 million recovery under the New York False Claims Act for taxpayer fraud. Also joining us today is David Koenigsberg. He is a partner in Mintz, Bonner, Komar, and Koenigsberg LLP in New York City, where for the last 20 years, he has represented whistleblowers in state and federal False Claims Act key TAM matters. Prior to private practice, he was the chief of the Affirmative Civil Enforcement Unit at the Southern District of New York. Recently, Mr. Koenigsberg had a substantial recovery under the New York False Claims Act in a case against Sprint alleging tax fraud allegations. Both Mr. Fox and Mr. Koenigsberg will help us understand why other states and perhaps the federal government are looking to the state of New York to craft legislation and efforts to recover stolen tax dollars. That all happens today on this episode of Fraud in America. David and Randy, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Fraud in America. So we uh, spent a lot of time thinking about you know, what this next show should be, and we try to identify some trends that we're seeing across the country. And the one that I know that is happening, because I'm getting the phone calls, is that states across the country are looking at New York, sometimes with envy about what's happening up there, uh, the Empire State seems to have got it right when it comes to going after the tax cheats of the world, and they're kind of leading the charge. So, Randy, you were the founding bureau chief of the New York Attorney General's Taxpayer Protection Bureau. Maybe you can start off by telling us, uh, what is the history here? What, what, what happened in New York? Why are they now leading the charge when it comes to tax fraud? Uh, sure. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, so New York amended its False Claims Act in 2010 to add tax violations as a violation that can be addressed by whistleblowers under the False Claims Act. And the Attorney General created a new bureau, the Taxpayer Protection Bureau, at the beginning of 2011 to address those very claims. There had been a Medicaid bureau before that and still is. And now there was a, a new bureau that was everything else when you're talking about frauds committed against the government and particularly these tax claims, because New York was unique in taking out uh, what had been the bar on tax claims under the False Claims Act. So before that, whistleblowers didn't have any opportunities to call out tax frauds committed against the state and the local governments in New York as well. So in uh, March of 2011, we turned on the lights in the Bureau and the cases started coming in. Uh, within a week or two, we got the first really big case, uh, which was David's case. And um, 
it really uh, started the ball rolling on harnessing the power of whistleblowers in New York. So, David, he mentioned your case. Uh, what was it about the New York False Claims Act, this new tax provision that went into effect a decade ago? Why did you decide this was the right vehicle for this case? And uh, you were the one that kicked the tires and got things rolling here. Like I've said before, it's, sometimes it's just a matter of, of luck in terms of who the uh, clients that walk in the door or, or, or email you. The client came came to us. The case involved telecommunications fraud and taxing telecommunication services. So, uh, w- uh, was key to the fact that New York had changed its law, and um, came to me because I had worked in New York in the New York area. So I think uh, was able to uh, work with them to shape the case in terms of how the statute worked and, and get it filed uh, right away. And fortunately, Randy was there and Greg was there and uh, Greg Krakauer. And they uh, took it up and ran with it. So it was a great partnership between the attorney general's office and my, and my firm to investigate the case and, and then bring it to fruition. Yeah, that, that's great. You know, one of, one of the things we oftentimes hear from uh, other states, policy leaders, things like that is, you know, you really probably shouldn't remove the so-called tax bar uh, because it's going to lead to everybody and their mother uh, filing a case against their next or dog's owner. Uh, you know, it's going to be ex-wives against ex-husbands. All this kind of uh, flood of cases are going to flow in the door. Randy, Randy, can you talk about the thresholds that are in the False Claims Act and why they are so important uh, to New York? Sure. I, I think one of the keys to the success of New York's program is that it focuses and it forces people to focus on big ticket tax frauds. It's not the cases where one neighbor is annoyed with the other neighbor and files a case. There are two dollar thresholds that you have to meet in order to bring a tax claim under the New York False Claims Act. Uh, First, the defendant has to have net income or sales of more than a million dollars in any tax year at issue. And the second is that the damages have to exceed $350,000. So for the damages to exceed $350,000, if you're thinking in terms of income taxes, That means that you basically have to hide income of something like $4 million to be within the the realm of what this law covers. So it really wants to focus the resources on the violations that will cause the biggest impact and affect the uh, public fisc the most. So I I have a lot of numbers in front of me and um, I try not to get too far down in the numbers, but some of these numbers really do catch my eye. So 10 years, uh, five hundred eighty-two million dollars recovered, so half a billion dollars. Um, you now, just trying to extrapolate at that out to the rest of the country. So this is one state, one state, half a billion dollars. Randy, is this something the federal government should look at? I mean, I'm looking up here, and it says that the IRS commissioner estimates that a trillion—that's with a T—and federal taxes go unpaid every single year. I'm not real good at math, but that's that's real money, right? So would this work at the federal level? I think it would. It's hard to grasp onto the apples to apples numbers sometimes. Um, but the New York program, if you look at the, the cost to the government in running it versus the recoveries, you get a return of investment of about 3,900%, which is pretty impressive. Better than Bitcoin. Um, and uh, another way to look at it is if you think about New York's population, which is about six, seven percent of the, uh, the nation's population, the New York program uh, has recovered about 10 or 11 percent of what the IRS whistleblower program recovers. So it's recovering something much greater than its proportion of the population. So that, that seems to be an indicator that this is a successful program that uh, is worth exporting beyond New York. Wow. So David, when I think of tax fraud, I slept through tax law in law school, so it's always find it very taxing. Um, but when, when you think about tax law, why are whistleblowers so important when it comes to uncovering these tax fraud schemes? Well, I think that the uh, issue is that they're on the ground and they're witnessing things going on in real time. And you know, with all due respect to the uh, New York State Department of Taxation and Finance, they have a vast responsibility to administer the tax uh, program in the state. And while they do a lot of auditing of big and small entities, the uh, whistleblowers can uncover or or observe things that are going on within companies or industries that may not be uh, readily apparent to 
the, uh, the bureaucracy. So it, it also bring expertise within uh, particular industries or corporations about how businesses operate that may not be available or evident on the surface to the tax authorities. And so, you know, if you have you know, cases involving investment banking or hedge funds, or in this case, telecommunications companies, there are things that are going on that don't appear on the surface, but require you to dig in and understand uh, what, what, how the business operates and uh, functions in order to understand how the impact of tax issues uh, play out in terms of ways people try to get around them. So David, uh, of the $582 million recovered, $330 million of it was your case uh, against Sprint Communications. The IRS has a TIPS program uh, in which the government has to carry the load in, in moving these cases forward. I was really struck by your case in that because of the way the False Claims Act works, the government was able to multiply its resources by tapping into your firm's resources to help move this case along. Can you talk a little bit about why that was so important in this case and in general? Well, I think it was very helpful in, in the spring case because I think uh, certainly at timing is everything. I think when we filed the case and then it was being investigated by the Attorney General's office, we were able to assist them in terms of setting up a database for documents, uh, helping them review the documents, giving uh, additional resources. Because I think the, the unit only, I don't know, Randy, you can tell me how many people you had in the unit, maybe 10 or 11 attorneys to, to handle the non-Medicaid uh, fraud cases that were uh, filed or had been filed. And so we, we were able to move quickly. There were budgeting issues, I think, at the beginning. So we were able to uh, pay for and set up the database to review the documents that were obtained via subpoena and uh, move quickly. So I think that really was a big assist in terms of getting helping the case move and get, get the investigation up and running and uh, proceed. And, and then, Randy, you, uh, after uh, working with the New York Attorney General's Office, you went to private practice, recently had a settlement of over a hundred million dollars. So the two of you represent a large percentage of the recoveries here. So I appreciate you guys joining us uh, here today. Uh, Randy, can you talk a little bit about that too? What, why this whole idea of resource multiplier is so important under the False Claims Act? Sure, compare it to the traditional tax enforcement tools out there, which are audits. All the burdens are on the government. And unfortunately, there are a lot of uh, people who try to manipulate that. I mean, we certainly encountered cases where uh, the allegations at least are that the defendant lied to the auditors and got away with it. So I, what we really need is new tools and new insights to when people are not following the rules. So identifying the issues is one way to multiply the government's resources uh, because you're no longer looking for the needle in the haystack. And then when you're carrying on the, the investigation, when you're the government, you have all these extra resources that you don't ordinarily have. Uh, you have um, people who can bring expertise, can bring uh, financial resources, can bring factual knowledge resources to the table that you really don't see under some of the traditional enforcement tools. So it broadens the team, but it also broadens the success because you're focused on the key stuff. Yeah, I mentioned earlier that I struggled with tax law in law school, but you wonder, in talking to you, Randy, before the show, uh, you mentioned that, you know, by and large, when you really get at it, uh, these aren't complicated tax frauds, right? Can you talk a little bit about uh, what you uncovered during your time at the New York Attorney General's office? You know, some people like to say that everything about tax is really, really complicated, and it's just not the case. Some things are, some things aren't, but the, the frauds that we've seen that have been addressed under the False Claims Act have been pretty straightforward. We're talking the classic two sets of books frauds, frauds where people uh, pretended they weren't really earning the income in New York when they were, frauds like Sprint. The allegation was that they were paying the sales tax the right way, lobbied uh, for the, uh, the sales tax law, saying this is how it works, and then a couple of years later turned around and did exactly the opposite. That, that's fairly easy to prove. It's not filled with gray areas. And because the False Claims Act is really about frauds and knowing violations, if you really are into a, a legitimate gray area where things are undecided, um, it, it's probably not going to be the best fit. Uh, the challenge is that you often have defendants saying that everything fits in a gray area, or even 
just their issue fits in a gray area. So it's really, you have to sort out, is this a clear issue or not? So David, uh, as I mentioned at the top of the show, a lot of states are pushing legislation right now, pointing to New York's success and saying, you know what, if it works there, why can't it work here? Um, where do you see this area going over the next 10 years? We have 10 years of experience with the New York False Claims Act going after tax fraud. Where do you see the next 10 years going? Well, I, I think I, you know, we've obviously been talking with, uh, you know, people from other states that have been uh, looking to amend their statutes because of the success of the New York law. And I think the balance struck, as Randy described, in terms of the thresholds is very important. Um, for example, there is, under the Illinois False Claims Act, you can bring uh, tax related uh, cases, and, but that statute has no limits. So there have been issues with whistleblowers filing cases for relatively small amounts and, and in many multiples of cases and may not be the most efficient use of, of resources. So I think that's the beauty of how the New York statute was uh, drafted to provide those thresholds and minimums to jurisdiction to apply. So I think it's something that will be uh, expanding. I think there are states that are uh, important looking, especially in terms of the the revenue issues that uh, we're, we see, and then, so I think that there is a there is an incentive for states to expand their enforcement arm and adopt laws like New York. So I think you are going to see this on the state level going forward. Yes. So Randy, uh, one of the things that's very important, uh, it's important to me, important to a lot of people across the country, is their privacy. So when it comes to tax fraud, you know, one of the things we hear is, you know, well, how are we going to protect people's privacy when it comes to their taxes? How did New York do it? New York uh, was sensitive to that, and they uh, they required the attorney general's office to work with the tax department. They also, uh, in the uh, amendment to the law in 2010, when they added the tax violations to the False Claims Act, they required that the attorney general's office gets to serve as a a gatekeeper to private tax information, um, because if the case is going forward without the attorney general's office, uh, the the whistleblower, the relator, as it's called, uh, cannot uh, subpoena the tax department for tax information without the sign off of the AG's office. And to, to my knowledge, actually, there's been none or very little uh, uh, of people requesting or subpoenaing documents from the tax department. So I have a question for you, uh, David. So you've been doing this a while. Yeah, you're one of my good friends, as are, as are you, Randy. Uh, when, you, when somebody comes in your office and is raising concerns, um, how do you assess whether or not this is the right person, the right whistleblower, the right client for you? Setting aside the allegations, the right person that you want to work with. Well, that's a good question. I think uh, one of the things that we, we False Claims Act key TAM lawyers do is spend a lot of time vetting cases, both on the facts and, and whether the, the client themselves is a reliable person. So you want to uh, dig into the weeds. You know, how did you get this information? Uh, what's your background? Why do you know this? How do you know this? Is it just sort of a rumor you've heard? Um, and, and so we spend a lot of time making sure that the not only is the information uh, meaningful, but also that the person is a uh, somebody that, you know, if you had to go to trial, could, you know, are they going to stand up to cross examination? Because you always have to look at a case as like, you know, obviously, you hope, hopefully, you get a great investigation in the settles. But I think we, we always want to say, well, how's this going to look down the road, in terms of if we actually have to try this case. So we, we try to make sure that the, uh, the information is reliable, that it's been legally obtained, and also that uh, the, the person who's brought it to, to our attention is somebody that, you know, we, we would be comfortable working with and, and uh, having somebody on the witness stand testifying and being cross-examined. So that's sort of the process we go through on any case. I did want to mention with the tax privacy issue that it did come up in the Sprint case in several ways. I think one was, uh, first of all, as the Relators Council, we never saw Sprint's tax files with the tax department. Um, the only documents we really saw were those that were subpoenaed by the state and were produced by Sprint. And there was also an issue in the case, um, there was an allegation that Sprint, uh, unlike Verizon and uh, AT&T and the other big carriers were, those were complying and Sprint was not. So Sprint actually subpoenaed the records of those other, they went to the tax department to subpoena those records and the AG fought that uh, uh, to, to the bitter end. And there was, uh, it, the decision got appealed 
And uh, there's a very narrow exception that the, the uh, appellate court found to produce certain kinds of documents from the tax department files. But, but the point being is that, you know, the taxpayer private information on file with the tax department is zealously guarded under New York state law and by the attorney general's office uh, in general as well. So I think it's any concern that there's going to be, you know, an opening up of, of, of the uh, trove of documents to whistleblowers is uh, misconceived. It's really very carefully uh, uh, honored. Such important safeguards built into the law. Uh, Randy, uh, similar question for you, wearing your old hat and your new hat, what makes a good case? What are the allegations that really uh, ring the bell for you? Um, the ones you can prove at the end of the day. Amen. <laughs> um, you know, a whistleblower is very often going to have a, a good window into a violation. Um, they might not have every single piece, but you need to have enough information to make it clear that this is a worthwhile case to pursue and, and to really think about where and what are the sources of evidence that are out there that might help prove this case down the road. So I, I look at cases the same way I do when I was in the government. What's the evidence? What's the likelihood of proving this? Are, are we relying on assumptions or, or are we relying on facts? What's the quality of the evidence? What's the quantity of the evidence? And it's important to recognize too that this is not really a policy job. This is uh, an enforcement job because a lot of people come in and say, you know, there really ought to be a law. Mm -hmm. um, but if, there, if the rules aren't in place, there's not going to be a violation that you can pursue using this tool. Um, this is a tool about enforcing the laws and rules that do exist. So I'm going to be focused on all of those kinds of issues and um, think about whether I mean, this, is, this is a case that's going to have legs. Yeah, for, for 10 years, I... I... Uh, wore uh, the hat that you guys wear being relators counsel and, and talking to potential clients. And it was always frustrating to me that outside of New York, uh, there really wasn't a vehicle to recover stolen state tax dollars. And on the federal level, the IRS whistleblower program had limitations to the point where it discouraged uh, a lot of people from stepping forward. Um, David, with all that being said, there likely is somebody listening to today's show who is in New York who knows about a tax fraud scheme happening in New York and is not quite sure what to do. What would you say to that person? Well, I would, I would say uh, there is a hotline. You can you know, uh, provide information to the tax department if you want to go that route. That is always available in terms of just providing information voluntarily. Uh, but if you do, there's no not necessarily that you're going to benefit personally from that. Um, but that that's certainly there. And some people actually have, have come to me and they say, well, they don't want to uh, necessarily get involved in a lawsuit and everything, and, and so they can do that. Uh, the other thing is, I is to you know consult a lawyer who's got experience in this area. Um, I can't, and I'm sure Randy's had this experience of people that come to us three years down the road after the case is filed by, you know, an attorney who's obviously a capable attorney but doesn't know uh, the process or how these statutes and programs work. And it's very important to get a lawyer who knows how to ask the right questions, assemble the right documents, how to present it. I think a key to this whole practice is taking the information you get from the client and, and packaging it in a way to, for the prosecutor, the attorney general's office or the US attorney's office. So you give them, a, you know, the idea is when you drop the complaint on them that you give them a roadmap and, and explain what the program is, what the violation is, uh, and not just sort of make a bunch of general allegations. So I think the key is to find the right lawyer, people who have experience doing this, either having been in the government or having a track record in private practice. Randy, I'll give you the last word. I have to say, one of the things I most appreciated when I was in the government was um, cases where counsel basically put themselves in my shoes. And they said, okay, I assume I have government subpoena power. How am I going to pursue this case? So then they can help me help the state, help them, uh, help the taxpayers uh, by recovering monies that were lost. Randy, David, I appreciate uh, your time today. I acknowledge you both for uh, you taking a plane and, and making sure that it is well. Uh, the New York State False Claims Act uh, going after tax fraud in a way that's 
uh, fruitful, productive, efficient, effective for the taxpayers. What a story. Today we talked about how one state is doing an exceptional job in recovering stolen tax dollars. The Empire State is leading the charge in making sure that tax cheats are not targeting the limited state tax dollars. Other states are looking to New York as an example on how they too can close the tax gap that is holding back so many states across the country. Next week, we're going to dive into the Federal False Claims Act and how this legislation has become the government's primary fraud fighting weapon on the next episode of Fraud in America. If you believe you've witnessed fraud against the government at your job or want to learn more about these important laws to combat fraud, visit fraudinamerica.com. On our website, you can find whistleblower lawyers, blogs from these expert attorneys, and more. You can also find a transcript of today's show, show notes, a way to contact our team, and a way to chip in to make sure we can keep bringing you the latest on fraud. This episode was edited and produced by Rachel Brooks, and our theme music is by Connor Chaos. A big thanks to our staff and researchers of Jeb White, James King, Emma Bass, Jackie DeMar, Kate Scanlon, Brian Markovitz, and Max Boltman. You can learn more about them at fraudinamerica.com slash team. Fraud in America is a project of Taxpayers Against Fraud Education Fund.